Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Rick Harms, uh, project engineer with the City of Thunder Bay and OJRA first vice president. I trust everyone has enjoyed your lunch and you perhaps had some time to uh, take in our exhibitors. Uh, it is my pleasure at this time to introduce Steve Clark. Minister Clark was first elected MPP for Leeds Grenville in 2010 and he hasn't lost since. In 2018, he was re-elected as MPP for the newly named riding of Leeds Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes and promoted to the role of Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Steve gained attention across Canada in 1982 when at the age 22 he was elected mayor of the city of Brockville. Steve served three terms as mayor and during his tenure he was also president of AMO. Prior to his election at Leeds Grenville MPP, he was the chief administrative officer for the town, uh, township of Leeds and the Thousand Islands. Please join me in welcoming the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, Mr. the Honorable Steve Clark. Thanks, Rick. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks. So, hello, everyone. How's uh, how's everyone this afternoon? Did you have a great lunch? It's all good? Well, it's, it's such a pleasure for me to be here. Thank you for that kind introduction, uh, Rick. I, I've been looking forward to coming uh, to this conference and speaking with you because you're the people on the front lines. You're the one that keeps our communities vital and strong. J'avais hâte de venir à cette conférence et de vous parler parce que vous êtes les personnes en première ligne qui travaillent pour que nos communautés Rest vivant et fort. But, you know, the thing that I always love about the OGRA conference is uh, the fact that it really highlights the important role that you play to work with our government on its priorities uh, and in terms of making our priorities a reality. So this is always a, a must-attend conference for myself and my colleagues. I understand that uh, Minister Scott was, uh, was here this morning and I think her message was you know, we're, we're getting ready to get shovels in the ground, which I think is a, a wonderful message for the OGRA div, uh, directors and, and members. Uh, priorities uh, for our government, in addition, like uh, making government services smarter and connecting people to places. And today, uh, I want to take the opportunity in my speech today to talk about some of the ways that our government is helping do just that. Around this time last year, I announced uh, $200 million dollars to help small, rural, and northern municipalities uh, do local service delivery reviews and find efficiencies. And a few months later, we also announced funding to help large urban municipalities. I am so thrilled with the first level of funding. Municipalities have reported that the reviews identifies, identified millions of dollars in savings in municipal governments. And at the Roma conference last month, I met with a lot of delegations from small and rural municipalities, and I was so very pleased to hear some of the innovative ways that they're able to use the municipal modernization funding. I'll give you an example. The County of Renfrew is planning to bring four satellite offices into its own county administration building. It's going to eliminate the rent that they currently have to pay for those offices. It's going to enable them to share equipment, a reception area, and also an area for residents to, that make payments to the municipalities. It's a big cost saver for the County of Renfrew. The response to the programs have been so terrific that last October, and I know you all know this, uh, I decided to expand uh, both the Municipal Modernization Fund and the Audit and Accountability Fund. And it was through our regional government review that we heard that our government needs to put municipalities in the driver's seat to find savings. Because as I think you've heard me say many times, you, you are best positioned to find those services and those savings in your community. So we're going to be investing up to $6 million annually over the next three years to help those 39 large urban municipalities find savings. And we have announced as well that we're renewing the Municipal Modernization Program with up to $125 million over the next four years to help those small, rural, and northern municipalities. So, so with that new funding, we are now investing over $350 million to help municipalities 
find efficiencies and to serve their constituents better. We know that by working together with municipalities, we respect taxpayers' dollars, but we also continue to build Ontario together. There are plenty of great ideas out there. The one thing I've heard over and over again is there are tremendous opportunities out there in the municipal sector. In fact, we received over 300 proposals from small and rural communities. Just last month, I announced funding for 27 joint projects, which were approximately covering 130 municipalities. So these were all of the applications as part of the Municipal Modernization Fund that included multiple municipalities working together. So I'll give you another example. The Perth County is leading the way with the four lower tier municipalities in the county, plus the town of St. Mary's. They're going to review their winter maintenance costs to see where the cost of their operation can be streamlined. And I think it's a great opportunity to further that collaboration among municipalities. We have to do more of that. So why am I here today? So I'm here today to announce the next round of municipal modernization funding. Up to $4 million will be provided to support projects in 42 municipalities. And these projects all have a common theme. We're finding ways to improve the local process when it comes to improving new housing and new commercial developments. The example I'll give you is from the town of Aurora. They're gonna review the process people uh, must follow when applying for a land use planning permit, either if they want to build a new house or expand or create a new business. The goal is to improve timelines and find savings so that local uh, residents, business in the town all benefit. Quicker approvals are gonna help increase housing for the people who call these municipalities home. So those are the projects that we've decided to move forward. I think you've heard me say over and over again that over the last 15 years, home ownership and affordable housing has become out of reach for way too many people. Our government believes that every Ontarian uh, deserves a place to call home. And the supply of housing just hasn't kept up with demand. So I hope that there are more initiatives like the town of Aurora. I think it's a great priority to have to streamline the development pro approval process. Um, also, at the United Counties of Prescott and Russell, they're looking to merge their current application process and share data across departments. Their goal is to make sure that customers don't have to submit the same information twice as part of the development approval process. And I, again, think that streamlined approach is definitely the way to go uh, at the county level. So I, I, I really can't stand here uh, at an OGRA conference, uh, especially when it's in the heart of the GTA, without mentioning transit and how important housing, as Minister of Housing, and transit is. Uh, people in this area, and quite frankly uh, across Ontario, want to see more shovels in the ground. They want to see more tracks laid, they want to see more trains uh, brought into service. They want to see more transit to help reduce gridlock all uh, through the GTA. And that's why uh, the Premier and uh, Mayor Tory signed a historic new agreement between the city and the province, uh, which is the most ambitious uh, subway expansion in the province's history. It's $28.5 billion over four uh, priority transit projects. Uh, and I think we all agree, and I know that the Honourable Caroline Mulrooney, Ontario's Minister of Transportation, uh, also agrees. And that's why she's working hard to create that integrated system. Uh, just last week, she introduced the Building Transit Faster Act, which is going to give the province the tools to expedite the, the planning, the design, and the construction of major transit uh, projects. She's also uh, recently made a, a tremendous announcement on the Regional Transportation Plan in Southwestern Ontario. So I, I'm reluctant to, to upstage uh, Minister Mulroney uh, and give more, but I, I, I know that she's excited uh, to speak to delegates this morning. Today, though, I want to mention the work that my ministry is doing uh, to support our government's transit plan, while also delivering on that housing piece that I mentioned earlier that has been uh, so key uh, in terms of the discussions that have taken place uh, all across this province. And, and the concept that I want to talk to you about is, is the concept of transit-oriented communities. Transportation planning experts uh, often talk about the last mile problem. And as most of you know, that's the issue of moving passengers from a transportation hub uh, to their final destination, like home or work, without having them to drive. 
And to solve this, I think transit is only half of the solution. And I really believe that where housing is located, especially around major transit station areas, is a, a real key. And that's where our strategy on transit-oriented communities comes from. It's the first of its kind in Canada, and it really maximizes that $28.5 uh, billion dollar investment from our government, and quite frankly, all the other transit investment that we're making. Uh, and I know that uh, the Associate Minister of Transportation, uh, the Honorable Kinga Serma, is also going to be speaking to OGRA delegates, and she has done just a tremendous job on this file. I can't tell you enough the work that we've been able to do together, because truly, uh, transit and housing go together. We're going to work with municipalities to create complete communities around transit hubs. And as we add more housing to these areas, we're going to ensure that that includes affordable housing. Nous allons travailler avec les municipalités pour créer des communautés complètes autour des centres de transport en commune et à mesure de que nous ajouterons uh, des logements dans ces zones, uh, nous veillerons également à ce que cela comprenne des logements abordables. Housing and transit, as I said, go hand in hand, and our plan will help more people live near the services and amenities they use every day, including good quality transit. So, uh, you know, I want to I recognize uh, my parliamentary assistant for uh, municipal affairs, uh, Jim McDonnell, who's uh, done a tremendous job in, uh, in working uh, on various consultations. Uh, when he was a mayor uh, in South Glengarry, I think, he, uh, I think he had a room upstairs at, during uh, Good Roads where he, uh, he held court. So if you're looking for uh, uh, a further meeting with P.A. McDonnell, I'm sure he'll be uh, giving you out the card of his, uh, his accommodation tonight for uh, more, uh, uh, you know, more, more discussions later on. I actually thought, uh, he, uh, he was uh, sending me this weird message because Saturday night he sent me this picture uh, and basically said the Zamboni driver beat the Leafs and I thought he was crazy and then I got back to my, uh, my apartment and realized he was, uh, he was brilliant. So I, but at the time I got this text and said, what, what the heck's Jim talking about? So anyways, let's hear it for PA Jim McDonnell. So our government is committed to working with all of our partners to, uh, to make life more affordable, strengthen communities, connect people to places, find efficiencies, and deserving and delivering smarter government. Uh, it's very hard work, but the one thing that I've learned both in my public life as a former mayor, a former president of AMO, a former uh, uh, chief administrative officer, and now as an MPP who sat on both sides of the government bench, we have to work every, with everyone in this room. We have to work with every single partner across the province. We need to continue to help create growth and prosperity. We need to help uh, residents and businesses, but we also need to build Ontario together. And we can't do it without groups like OGRA. I wanna thank you all for the work that you do, both at your home municipalities, but also collectively. This is a very, very strong voice uh, in our government. And I know on behalf of, uh, of Minister Scott, who spoke uh, this morning, Minister Mulroney, and Minister Serma, who will speak tomorrow uh, and Wednesday, and also by, as myself, I wanna really thank the partnership. Uh, I'm going to be meeting with the uh, OGRA executive, and I really value uh, your opinions uh, and uh, your recommendations. So, so thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your OGRA conference. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Minister Clark, and uh, it's always uh, welcoming to have the Minister of Municipal Affairs at the OGRA conference. Uh, it's especially exciting when you can bring us news on the funding initiatives. So moving forward here, our, our next sh second shift disturber is Richard Steiner. Richard will be talking about Gatnick's autonomous vehicles. Gatnick is an autonomous vehicle company based in Toronto and Palo Alto focusing on business-to-business short-term haul logistics. Its mission is to deliver goods safely and efficiently using autonomous vehicles. Gatnick has an autonomous vehicle here today and is providing tours. I, in fact, uh, had a chance before lunch to see it uh, just outside at the uh, Valet East uh, 
east entrance. Uh, if you'd like to take a tour of the vehicle, there may still be some spots available, and you would need to go to the registration. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Richard. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you very much indeed for the warm welcome. Um, representing Gaddock, as you heard, uh, incredibly excited to be here. This is a wonderful opportunity for us, and I'm so thrilled there's so many people to talk to you today. Uh, Ten minutes is a really short time to get through um, the wealth of information that we could speak about with autonomous vehicles, so I will try and be direct uh, and, and to the point. And as you just heard, much more important than me, one of our vehicles is stationed outside, so hopefully this is a nice way to plug that. If anyone's interested, please come out afterwards and, uh, and take a look at the vehicle. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So a little bit more about us. Um, a quick snapshot. Uh, founded in 2017 um, by three veterans of the autonomous technology space in Palo Alto. Now very pleased to say we have offices well established here in Toronto. And I'll talk a bit more about some big announcements that we've got coming up. Some of the investors that we uh, are backed by there, you can see on the right-hand side, and the organizations uh, with whom our staff have worked, you see there at the bottom. The most important point to take away from this slide, though, is people often say, um, OK, so when is this happening? Autonomous vehicles, AVs, when are they going to hit the roads? So we've been operating in the States um, for the best part of eight months now um, with our flagship customer, Walmart, down in the US. And as you can see there, we're uh, soon to be making um, a fairly exciting uh, announcement about operations upcoming here in Canada. So what's the problem that we've been trying to solve? Uh, commerce is exploding, e-commerce especially, but the supply chain is stuck. Um, the current foundation doesn't support growth. About 90% of retailers lose money on each one of the deliveries. This is the problem that we set out to address. So to be clear, we transport goods safely and efficiently rather than passengers. The supply chain, you can see there from the schematic, um, in, as, it's, as it's been in the past, fairly inelastic, and the industry, logistics industry has been dealing with driver shortages as well uh, and some non-scalable issues. So these are the problems that we set about trying to solve. How are we doing it? So our mission, delivering goods safely and efficiently using uh, autonomous vehicles. Our focus specifically is business to business, short haul logistics. So whereas some autonomous vehicle technology companies working in the delivery space are looking at long haul trucking, um, so big semi trucks working on, uh, on highways, large payloads, or sidewalk robots, we call it different things sometimes, sidewalk robots with smaller payloads and, uh, and limited carrying capacity, we're focusing exclusively on the middle mile. So business to business, not trying to change consumer behavior, but optimizing the hub and spoke supply chain. It's a perfect use case for autonomous vehicles. And uh, the next slide will tell you why. What sets us apart is that we operate on fixed routes. So fixed, repeatable, predetermined routes. This allows it, uh, our engineers, and I don't want to make any of this sound easy, but it allows our engineers to map out these fixed predetermined routes time and time again um, so that they can be delivered in the safest and most efficient way possible. Again, we transport goods. Um, and uh, I've also noted there, and I'll flag Ontario here, Ontario has a wonderfully progressive uh, program in place for autonomous vehicles. And as I've mentioned, we have a, a, rather, a rather exciting announcement coming up very soon, so, so watch this space. Edge cases um, have really been keeping AVs from, from getting to full autonomy. I mean, the, the thing which I think is, um, is helping, to, <laughs> helping to slow down the tide of the autonomous revolution, uh, the unknowns. And again, this is why what we're doing we feel is so effective and is such a useful uh, business case for AV deployment on the roads. Uh, the routes can be mapped, and our specific uh, approach to um, combination of deep learning and conventional robotics is allowing us to get there. I want to highlight front and center every single thing we do is safety. Um, best practices, standards, and processes that we employ from a variety of different industries, medical, automobile, aviation, military. We also follow recommendations by US NHTSA, and of course, in considering deployment in Canada, we'll be following Canadian standards and guidelines as well. And ISO um, it goes without saying. So safety is front and center of all of our practices, and we want to be very, very clear about that for all road users. 
And so now, perhaps most excitingly, I can actually show you uh, what things look like in the vehicle on the road. So I'll just play the video and I'll describe a little bit of what's going on here. There we go. So this is a picture, Kumavat, one of our co-founders and chief engineers. She was uh, uh, unfortunately called away, so, uh, so you have me today, but you get to see her in the vehicle there. You can see her hands at eight and four. So we have safety operators, autonomous vehicle operators in all of our vehicles ready to intervene should that be required. This is some uh, live footage from one of our routes uh, in the United States uh, operating between uh, a distribution center and a collection point. In the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, you can see what the vehicle sees. 10 minutes is not long enough to go into uh, the, the technical specs of the LiDAR, radar, GPS, uh, and high-res cameras that we use to operate our proprietary autonomous vehicle technology. But please, please, I encourage you to come and have a chat with myself and one of our engineers um, out at the East Valley entrance uh, after the talk today. You can take a look at the vehicle, and we can give you an in-depth walkthrough of, uh, of how this functions. Um, something I always like to, to say is that having been in an autonomous vehicle as the vehicle is, is driving itself, the first five minutes, absolutely, absolutely wild, mind-blowing. And then quite quickly, it becomes quite boring, which is a wonderful thing. It's because it's safe and it's reliable and it's, been, and it's doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. So what does our business model allow? We are helping to save the customers with whom we're working huge amounts of costs. We are highly over-optimizing the supply chain hub and spoke model. Um, really what it's all about is the fact that consumers these days want to click a button and get access to their goods in a very short space of time. They don't really think about the vastly complex and costly mechanism along the supply chain to get their goods to the place that they want them to be. So we're really helping to improve that process and scalable. Um, again, I'll come back to the fixed, repeatable, predetermined routes that we're using to over-optimize these supply chain routes, uh, which really does mean that this model is commercial, uh, commercialized and scalable. And with that, I say thank you very much for listening, and please come to see us at the East Valley entrance. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very Cheers. much. Absolute pleasure. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. As the old adage goes, the future is now. Um, we are waiting on MPP Schreiner, the leader of the Green Party of Ontario. Um, so we will be back to introduce him shortly. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Akash Desai. I'm the Deputy Mayor from the Municipality of Grey Highlands and OGRA Director. It is my honor to introduce Mr. Mike Schreiner. Mike Schreiner is the leader of the Green Party of Ontario and the MPP for Guelph. He is the first ever Green MPP elected to the Ontario Legislature. He was elected in the 2018 provincial election with a resounding 45% of the vote. Mike has been the leader of the Green Party of Ontario since 2009. Under his leadership, the Green Party of Ontario has experienced substantial growth. Returning to the OGRA stage, the leader of the Green Party, Mike Schreiner. Thank you, Akash, for that very kind introduction, and it's such a pleasure to join all of you today. And uh, before I begin, I just want to take a moment to just express my gratitude that we're meeting on the traditional lands of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, the Mississaugas, of the Credit. And given the events of this morning and uh, the past few weeks, just the importance of recognizing indigenous law and also peaceful reconciliation as we figure out how best to move forward. I want to take a moment to also congratulate Scott Butler, the new executive director of the Ontario Good Roads Association, and thank uh, Joe Tierney for his work uh, as the outgoing executive director. And I want to thank everyone in this room for your ongoing advocacy and expertise in helping to manage and advocate for um, critical infrastructure throughout Ontario. You know, the world is changing, not only because we've elected Ontario's first Green MPP, 
though, you know, the first fourth party elected the legislature since the 1940, uh, five election, believe it or not. But if you think about it, back in 1945, uh, we wouldn't have had a discussion on roads that included the talk of how do we create space for bike lanes? How do we install electric vehicle chargers? How do we guard our infrastructure against the climate crisis? How do we recycle aggregates and make sure we can reuse them? But those are some of the things I want to talk a bit about today because that's the reality of life in 21st century Ontario. And I want to thank the Ontario Good Roads Association for your steadfast advocacy in supporting a Vision Zero policy for Ontario. Uh, I believe road safety and the commitment to road safety for all users, whether it's a cyclist or a pedestrian or a road maintenance worker, somebody using a wheeled mobility device is vitally important. And as we look around the world, we've seen the cities that have adopted Vision Zero policies. I'm thinking of New York of all places, have seen pedestrian deaths fall, in the case of New York, by 44%, and overall traffic fatalities down by 27%. And I believe it's time to scale up Vision Zero from the communities in Ontario, like London and Toronto, Peel, Durham region, and others, to highlight and make it possible across Ontario. And I just want to highlight the work that I did, and I want to do a shout out to MPP Jessica Bell from the NDP, because uh, I know when the transportation bill came to committee last year, both of us worked very hard in putting forward a number of amendments to really implement a Vision Zero for Ontario and ensure that all of Ontario roads are safe for all users. But I would also argue, at least in my case, putting forward infrastructure plans that help make rural Ontario especially accessible to the burgeoning tourist industry for cycling. Over $300 million in Quebec alone. And I think there are huge opportunities to integrate cycling, tourism, and local food and Ontario farm and food infrastructure to create both a cycling tourist industry and a local food industry that benefits all of our communities. I also want to talk about how important it is when we think about our transportation budgets to go beyond our traditional funding categories of funding transit and roads, but to also start putting in permanent year-over-year -year stable funding for active transportation. You know, we've had one-offs through um, the cap-and-trade program, for instance, or through federal grants to municipalities, but nowhere, nowhere in Ontario's transportation budget is there a permanent funding stream for active transportation, and I believe that needs to change. It's part of rethinking our roads, and I believe that a modern approach to roads means thinking about how they can accommodate public transit, buses, streetcars, bikes, pedestrians, innovative rural transportation solutions that focus on moving people, not always moving cars. I also want to talk about the importance of ensuring that we address the challenges that rural municipalities in particular, but all municipalities face, and in especially when it comes to addressing issues around liability. You know, I've come to OGRA and I've come to Roma, and I've talked about the importance of addressing joint and several liability. And I was hoping after last year uh, the, our advocacy was working because the Premier brought it up at Roma. And I thought when we saw the consultations last summer that we were going to have changes to laws take place, and we've heard nothing since the consultations last summer, and I think that's unacceptable. We need the government to get moving to protect the rising costs that municipalities face around liability by addressing joint and several liability. I also want to talk about how important it is to ensure that our economy and our communities are ready for the electrical vehicle revolution that's taking place. 
You know, just last week, Amazon announced that they want to become carbon neutral. And one of the ways in which they're going to do that is a thousand new electric delivery vehicles in their fleet. We know that global automakers are going to invest $355 billion over the next five years taught researching how they're going to implement electric vehicles in North America and Europe. And the question is, the question is, is Ontario going to utilize our expertise in automobile manufacturing to lead the EV revolution, to create the jobs and the prosperity that's coming, or are we going to lose jobs to other jurisdictions? So I think it's absolutely essential that this province have an EV strategy in place so that we're producing the 1.5 billion electric vehicles that will be on the road by 2025. You know, 52% of Canadians say they want to own an electric vehicle, but they have two concerns. One is cost, though that's coming down, and we know it costs one-fifth to one-tenth to operate an electric vehicle versus a non-electric vehicle. But the other concern is charging infrastructure. And I can tell you as an electric vehicle owner, uh, I share their concern because it can be hard sometimes to find a place to charge, particularly as you get uh, outside of larger cities like Toronto. And it's one of the reasons I was proud to show that even in today's hyper-partisan political world, where I feel like we have too many political parties that think about how you tear each other down rather than build Ontario up. I was able to co-sponsor a bill with MPP Lauren Coe of the Conservatives to bring in, it was actually, I think, believe that the first private member's bill that was passed during this parliament, to bring in uh, fines for non-electric vehicles blocking electric vehicle charging stations, which I know is a small but important step of advancing adoption of electric vehicles in Ontario. And I think it's one of the examples that we can see where you, know, you can criticize the government one day and work with the government the next day to get things done for the people of Ontario. And I think that's what people want. Political parties are gonna work together to build us up instead of tear each other down. But I also wanna challenge the government that we have to bring in tax incentives to ensure that we have electric vehicle charging infrastructure built out across the province. I believe the private sector is ready to deliver on that, provided their appropriate tax incentives in place. We need to reverse the changes they made to the building code to ensure that our buildings are ready for the electrical vehicle revolution that's going to happen. Because again, we want Ontario to lead that revolution, not lose jobs to it. I also want to address something that I will have to, again, compliment the Ontario Goods Roads Association to bringing to my attention. I've oftentimes talked about the concerns that citizens, particularly in rural communities, have around how do we protect water and farmland from aggregate operations. It's an issue that's been near and dear to my heart as somebody who grew up on a farm and somebody who believes deeply in protecting green space and water. But we also need aggregate to, for our buildings, for our roads, for much of our infrastructure. But the reality is, is we have millions of tons of stockpiled, reclaimed asphalt pavement available in Ontario that can be used to help reduce the cost, the financial cost associated with virgin aggregate extraction could help significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, as a matter of fact, if we would start recycling some of the 6.4 million tons of virgin, of, or sorry, it would help reduce the 6.4 million tons of virgin aggregate being utilized each year, it would also, by doing so, eliminate the equivalent of two million barrels of oil from our roads, and it would save $270 million in road construction. If we would just start recycling aggregates for our roads, technology that other jurisdictions, including many places here in Ontario, already do. So as far as I'm concerned, it makes sense to implement policies that reduce climate pollution, reduce 
financial costs associated with road construction, and at the same time, help maintain and preserve our rural landscapes and protect local water resources. And to me, it's these kinds of innovations which are a part of Ontario embracing the largest economic opportunity that exists in the world today, the $26 trillion clean economy. It's not just electric vehicles. It's not just recycling materials. It's also investing in clean energy solutions. It's investing in advanced manufacturing and autonomous vehicles. It's ensuring that the prosperity that is generated from the $26 trillion economic opportunity that's before us is reinvested in our communities to ensure that we invest in the caring professions, healthcare, long-term care for our seniors, childcare for our children, education, including changes to the educational funding formula that keep rural schools open. It's about investing in infrastructure. It's about helping municipalities deal with a $60 billion infrastructure backlog. As part of that, it's about providing, give and providing municipalities with revenue tools to address the backlog in infrastructure and services in ways that don't, doesn't download it all onto the backs of property taxpayers, which is the most regressive form of taxation. It's about ensuring that our rural communities are ready, ready to take advantage of the clean economy, whether it's advances in precision agriculture, which is coming out of universities like the University of Guelph in my community, whether it's about robotics in animal agriculture, where it's about changes in greenhouse food production. If we are going to do that, we have to invest in rural broadband infrastructure. You know, so much of the infrastructure of the 20th century for our communities was our electrical grid and our roadways. 21st century infrastructure includes rural broadband. If our rural communities are gonna be successful, we have to make the investments in the infrastructure of the future today. Infrastructure that's essential to ensuring that our rural communities are ready to embrace the new economic opportunities that present themselves. And while I know the Premier has talked about, you know, 100 million or, three, or 300 million dollars for rural broadband, the bottom line is, is it's actually a cut from the previous government's budget when it comes to rural broadband. And it's not enough. It's not enough to ensure that we invest in the infrastructure to make our rural communities prosperous, to make the investments to attract capital and investment for job growth in our rural communities. We know that the fiber optic infrastructure deficit for southwestern Ontario alone is pegged at around $4 billion. So these are the kinds of investments we're going to need to make in our rural communities. And I know the question most of you are probably asking me is, Mike, we have a fiscal deficit. How's Ontario going to make these kinds of investments? Well, first, I would say that the people of Ontario are problem solvers, not problem deniers. And if you actually crunch the numbers, they tell you a story of how we can invest in the infrastructure we need. First of all, we have a $7.4 billion, not a $15 billion budget deficit. And second of all, $5 billion of the $7.4 billion deficit is for Ontario to be the only jurisdiction in North America to directly subsidize electricity prices, a program that the Liberals brought in and I call the unfair hydro program because it primarily benefits the wealthy in our society who use the most electricity. So even if we just means tested, and by the way, the current government, when they were in opposition, most of their members opposed the unfair uh, hydro plan. Even if we just means tested it, we would free up billions that could be used to reduce our deficit 
without it being put on the backs of our education system, our healthcare system, our municipal councils, uh, and the most vulnerable in our society. So I would argue that we need to have an honest conversation about what the fiscal picture of this province is. The bottom line is, is we have the lowest per capita spending on public services of any province in this country. And we have the lowest revenue of any jurisdiction, any province in this country. As a matter of fact, according to the Financial Accountability Officer, the main area in which we have such low revenue is from our natural resources, even though we're the largest mining jurisdiction in Canada. So I believe there are ways in which we can look at bringing in more revenues without the burden falling on the backs of people with modest and middle incomes, without the burden falling on the backs of small business owners and entrepreneurs. If we look at our resource wealth and ensure that we provide, we obtain the revenue from that, but we also need to look at the spending side and ensure that we spend our dollars efficiently and effectively in a way that helps the people who need it the most so we can invest in our communities. So I want to conclude by saying that I believe the Green Party has a vision of how we can create a, po a prosperous, caring, and inclusive Ontario if we embrace a clean and caring economy. Imagine if 100 years ago, Ontario hadn't embraced Niagara Falls electricity generation and the auto sector. Imagine what the province would look like today. So in the next 75 years, it's the clean and caring economy that's going to generate that wealth. And it'll be up to us, our generation, to embrace it so we can create the prosperity that our children and grandchildren deserve while at the same time addressing the climate crisis that's affecting so many of our communities right now. So I want to thank you for the amazing work that you do. I want to thank you for the leadership you provide this province. And I want you to know that you have a partner in my office and in the Green Party to move this province forward in a way that addresses prosperity, livability, and ensuring that our communities have the investments we need to be successful in the 21st century. Thank you, and have a wonderful, wonderful conference. Well, thanks, Mike. We, we OJR really appreciates the support and the ideas of the Green Party. So once again, thanks to Mike Schreiner. Thank you. Thanks. Absolutely. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris Traney. I'm the county engineer for Middlesex County and OGRA's immediate past president. The vision and plans for Toronto's waterfront are unprecedented, are an unprecedented attempt to build a community of the future. The proposal by Sidewalk Labs, the city building arm of technology giant Google, has been called an eco friendly, tech heavy Tomorrowland. This enthusiasm has bumped up against the tech lash. Controversy over data mining and the thrust of a tech giant in the city's life has caused a rethink. Waterfront Toronto is the public custodian of Toronto's waterfront revitalization and this futuristic project. We are very fortunate today to be joined by Cameron Mackay and Christina Werner from Waterfront Toronto. They will share with us how a public entity like Waterfront Toronto navigates one of the most anticipated and scrutinized community building projects ever undertaken. Please join me in welcoming Toronto Wa Waterfront Toronto's Christina Werner and Cameron Mackay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, um, everyone. I'm, I'm Cameron Mackay. I'm joined by my colleague, Christina Werner, uh, and thank you for having us. Uh, you know, when Scott called me last month or a couple of months ago, he said, you know, our conference theme this year is a vision for a prosperous tomorrow. Uh, we'd like to talk about next generation communities, uh, smart cities. I said, we, we'd love to join you and talk about them. So that's what we're here for today. Um, I'm going to just um, walk through a couple of um, uh, slides. Our agenda is, is, is pretty light. We want to talk about, you're, you're 126 years old, we're about 20 years old, so we, we like to share some of the accomplishments we've made over the last 20 years of placemaking on Toronto's waterfront. 
Uh, we want to talk about our innovation agenda. We do have one. We've always had one. It's in our DNA. It's in our mandate. We want to talk about the urban issues that we're trying to solve for on the waterfront, some of which can be translated into communities across Ontario, across the country, and throughout the world. We want to spotlight some of the solutions we've identified for the Keyside project. We'll talk about what the Keyside project is in greater detail, but we're in a position now and we'll be going to have public uh, consultations uh, this weekend, uh, unpacking some of the solutions that our innovation partner has brought and the ones we think can really uh, cross the finish line. And finally, we want to share with you, and I think it would be particularly valuable, some of the lessons we've learned in terms of scale and in terms of what can be done in your own communities. So with that, uh, I said our, our organization is about 20, 20 years old. It was, um, it was founded after a task force led by a fellow named Bob Fung concluded that there had never been an agency that had uh, a, a focused effort to redevelop the industrial lands that are the, Toronto's waterfront. And when you think about uh, the waterfront, it, we're, we're sitting at the, at the Royal York. Most of the land to the south of us was infill. It was all used for industrial purposes. And, and um, it had laid in, in disuse for many years. Much of the land is government owned. Uh, so Mike Harris apparently, according to Bob Fung, called up uh, Bob and said, Bob, can you lead a task force so that we can get our waterfront redeveloped? It was partially in anticipation of a global, uh, of a uh, Olympic bid. But uh, he took the mantle and we, our corporation was created. In terms of what it is, as I said, it's about 2,000 acres of land. It runs from, um, from Coxwell uh, uh, to, um, to, to Dowling, um, and it, um, it, it is enshrined in legislation. And that is our, 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 our kind of our, uh, our, our designated waterfront area you'll see up on the map. And. Um, a few things to know about us, uh, five things in particular. We don't have base funding. We, we, are, we operate because we retain some of the proceeds of land value, uh, and we, fund, we use that, those proceeds to fund future innovations and for, for other future infrastructure investments. So we have, for, um, for, for 20 years, put in the enabling infrastructure that allows for development. That increases property values. We bring those to market, and on and on it goes. We, re we did receive, I just said we didn't receive base funding, we did receive a nice generous $1.5 billion back in the day as seed capital. And we're pleased to say we've, re we've returned that uh, many fold, about seven five, we think about $7.5 billion in, in tax revenue through, through uh, uptick and uh, economic development. We do have, and Christina's gonna talk about this, an innovation and economic development agenda. They drive our work. Uh, we have to do a better job talking about that, but I think the Keyside project has been uh, instructive and helpful in that respect. Uh, we work with uh, private and public uh, partners to deliver on development. We're going to talk about how we work with some of the best development partners to deliver uh, extraordinary outcomes. So those are five things about Waterfront Toronto. Um, some of our achievements um, over the years, we... Um, we, we like our infrastructure to do double duty. So Sherburn Common, for example, that's a before picture. Sherburn Common, what you're going to see here is a, is a stormwater uh, fountain that provides uh, stormwater uh, cleaning through a uh, ultraviolet system for a whole neighborhood. So stormwater comes in, we clean it, uh, it becomes a part of public art and it, it's a fountain, um, and it, um, it then is sent out into Lake Ontario. When we don't have enough storm water, we actually bring in water from Lake Ontario, clean it, and send it back. But that's, that's a piece of infrastructure in a park that looks like public art. Of course, uh, we delivered Canada's Sugar Beach. It's iconic. It's uh, now become uh, associated with uh, Toronto. Toronto, lots of brochures across the world feature this picture. Um, we're very proud of this, uh, this, this particular project. Uh, what you're looking at here is West Dawnlands. It's, it's, a, um, it's an example of master class in, in placemaking. Uh, it was delivered in anticipation of the Pan Am Games. It provides affordable housing. We delivered the first new transit, um, uh, transit route on Cherry Beach in 16 years. Um, it was a industrial brownfield. Um, and now it is a vibrant community that has uh, tremendous uh, public facilities community facilities. What you're seeing here is what's called, um, excuse me, it is a berm, which is uh, actually flood protecting downtown. So it's an elevated berm, 
at the base of the Don, Don River, uh, and it's a, it's a vital park, but it's also, again, doing double duty as a flood protection uh, uh, device called Corktown, Corktown Common. Queen's Key is an example of a first complete street. Uh, we haven't seen a street like this in Toronto, in fact, in Canada before. Uh, it is uh, multimodal. We have, more tra we have way more bike tra traffic than we ever thought about. It's, uh, it, it continues to be an award winner, and people from all around the world come to see the design typology of it. This is the first ever under, uh, underground, under, uh, park under a elevated uh, highway. This is, um, again, in the West Donlands. It, we converted, it was a hugely successful. Uh, it led the way for another project called the Bentway. Some of you may have heard about it. It's now becoming a thing to build parks under elevated highways. Um, and we're very proud of this as well. Our signature project right now is, is the Portland's uh, Flood Protection Project. It is a $1.25 billion massive infrastructure project uh, that is going to bring um, hundreds of acres of land into development. Some 25,000 people will live in the Portlands uh, after, after it's complete. About 30,000 people will work there. It is going to unlock uh, the size, basically, of downtown Toronto in the Portlands. It's going to be a game changer. Uh, we're expecting it to be uh, completed in 2024 and development beginning. Uh, we talked about how we raised the bar. This is an example of our first. It's called River City. It's again in, in, the, uh, in the West Onlands. It is an example of a lead gold building. We led the market with lead gold um, back in the day. It's now table stakes. Uh, we said to our developer, look, we want to get lead gold. We realize it's expensive. We're prepared to invest to get to get, to get there. It's now, again, table stakes lead gold. And if you read Building Magazine this morning, you would have seen Aquilina last month, also in our precinct on, on, uh, on Queen's Key, received lead platinum. And there are two more lead platinum buildings uh, that are being contemplated for, or that are, that are seeking certification or tra targeting it. So that's an example of where we've set up higher bar than, than, than the standards generally prevail generally prevailing standards, and we've attained them, and we've actually changed the market. Market transformation, and, and Christina will talk about this, is a part of our mandate as well. People like what we're doing as well. We were out, uh, we worked with Angus Reed Forum about a year ago and uh, asked a series of questions about, uh, uh, about what people wanted in communities, and um, mixed-use uh, communities, which have all, you know, retail and, and, and all the kind of amenities, came out as, as being extremely supported in, in Canada, and particularly in Toronto. Toronto, the number spikes to about 85%. People are unambiguously supportive of complete communities, and that's all we build. They also, of course, and in larger cities like Toronto, prioritize um, public spaces and public realm, public parks a lot more. We're proud to have been delivering that. Toronto, again, higher than the average. 65% of Canadians love their public spaces, about 78% in Toronto. So we're delivering what people want. What this slide doesn't show, and it was a part of our data, was we did ask a series of questions about um, whether or not people like the communities they lived in, and Canadians do, and they should. Uh, we've got terrific, terrific infrastructure. You turn on the, the tap and the water comes out, and people are generally safe, so they're, they're quite happy. We asked questions what, about certain uh, technologies that could be used to enhance the urban experience, and about 92% of Canadians said, yeah, we like the idea of, A, we like our communities, but we really like the idea of, of, of that they can be better. And we support agencies like Waterfront Toronto and municipalities in leading that agenda. So with that, I'm going to ask Christina to, uh, to speak about our innovation agenda. Great. Thanks, Cameron. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be able to join you today. And I just want to make one little housekeeping note, just so everybody knows who I am and what I do. I am actually the Vice President of Innovation, Sustainability, and Prosperity with Waterfront Toronto, not Sidewalk Labs, as it says up there. So <laughs> quite a different perspective, perhaps, than what they would bring. Um, Waterfront Toronto has always had an innovation mandate in terms of how we look at revitalization. So in addition to sort of the traditional redevelopment work that we do, we've always embedded a higher standard of sustainability and also looked for ways to create enabling innovation infrastructure to attract the next generation of jobs to the waterfront. Back in 2014, we adopted our own innovation agenda sort of statement, which is to create a world-leading exemplar of 21st century city building where the physical, digital, social, environmental, and economic factors align to create an exceptional quality of life. So that is well before the Keyside RFP, and that actually nests back into some of our heritage 
and looking at the intelligent community model, which many of you might be familiar with in the work that they've done in municipalities throughout Canada. The ICF is a, a global think tank that looks at how cities can actually embrace technology and innovation to take the sort of next step up in terms of city building. Uh, and it looks at six key areas, so connectivity, so the, the enabling broadband infrastructure, sustainability, which is triple bottom line in their model, inclusivity and bridging the digital divide, engagement and advocacy and telling the story and sharing best practices and lessons learned, innovation, and that's across all different realms, so technology, business case, financial models, partnerships, and so on, as well as creating the condition for the next generation of work. We have a framework that guides the work that we've been doing in the waterfront called a Waterfront Toronto Resilience and Innovation Framework. It started very heavily focused on the environment and then we've added in the digital layer on top of that. And looking at notions like collaborative governance, looking at data informed decision making, and really creating the evidence base that we need to, to uh, quantify and discuss how technology can actually transform an area. But rather than just simply experimenting and not reporting back, we've been very intentional about how we've actually been tracking. Our resilience and innovation framework actually sets out our vision between now and 2030 in the waterfront and has a series of steps all guided originally um, by some of the outcomes from the COP21 conference and looking towards reducing our GHG targets as well. In terms of our accomplishments in this space, Waterfront Toronto focused very heavily on the infrastructure elements in its early days. We created Canada's first privately funded fully fiber optic gigabit network in the waterfront working with a company called Beanfield Metro Connect, which is a local telecommunications firm here. In that, it actually has a digital inclusion strategy to ensure that no one gets left behind. So a very unique aspect of this model is rather than actually depending on government funding to build the broadband infrastructure, we actually cross-subsidize from the market housing, the affordable housing units for both the capital build, but also in terms of the month-to-month -month costs. So in many cases, just most recently, the market units have gone down to $50 a month for symmetrical gigabit services. But in the affordable housing units, they're actually paying anywhere between 50% of that or actually nothing. So in the, the deepest subsidized, they actually get that service for free. We also have been very intentional in creating an innovation corridor by attracting some key tenants. And that started with attracting George Brown College down to the waterfront, which is now expanding into its second and third campuses on the waterfront as well. The University of Toronto, Mars Discovery District, Artscape and WPP, the international publishing company and digital advertising company, are all coming down to the waterfront. In addition, there's a number of arts incubators and music incubators that have chosen to come down to the waterfront because of the cluster of companies and activities that are happening in that area. In 2014, we actually led the bid to have Toronto recognized as the Intelligent Community of the Year by the ICF, which has previously been won by, by uh, cities like Stockholm and Tokyo, New York, so we were in good company. One of our crown jewels that is currently being built that speaks to our innovation corridor is the Menkes Waterfront Innovation Centre, which similar to the network build, doesn't actually involve any public funding for actually seeing this come above ground. So unlike a lot of the regional innovation centres and campus-linked accelerators, this is a fully privately funded uh, development that's occurring in the waterfront. And this is where the U of T and Mars will be housed. Now, that brings us to around early 2017, some of the milestones that we had. And as I said, COP21 occurred, and there was a real serious thought around extreme weather events and GHG emissions and how climate change was actually becoming a very big factor in how we were planning our cities. In addition, looking at things like household waste and how we could actually do waste diversion much more smartly, traffic congestion. I can't even imagine if I didn't have the GO train how long it would take me to get in from Hamilton each and every day. Vehicular emissions, road trauma, and the goals around Vision Zero, how could we actually enable some of that in the neighborhoods we were building? Very acutely looking at the affordability crisis that's facing Toronto in terms of its housing, looking at cost of living overall, dealing with our, our aging population and the reality that we're facing about how we can actually encourage aging in place, future-proofing the jobs, as I mentioned before, and very importantly, helping Canadian innovators being able to overcome the barriers that they were facing in going to scale and keeping Canadian intellectual property here in Canada. What that led us to was the Keyside Project, which is a 12-acre site in the East Bayfront neighborhood, where we actually uniquely owned the bulk of the land for this project. So we had a really unique opportunity for Waterfront Toronto to once again try and do some market transformation 
and raise the bar both in terms of our sustainability and innovation targets that we had. There was really a goal for us to use this site to become a magnet to attract global talent and create a global hub for urban innovation, so across various different disciplines. This is an overview site of the Keyside project, the 12 acres. Again, you'll see it's very much derelict land. We also have on the site here, that's actually the Bayside project where Cameron just showed you the Aqualuna and Aqua uh, Vista sites. Instead of us going forward like we usually do with our development RFPs, Waterfront Toronto embarked on something slightly different. We started to look for an innovation and funding partner. This came out of a year-long process of doing market sounding across various different industries and trying to establish what the private sector appetite was to work in a unique partnership on a, a sort of real estate opportunity that involved public space, it involved buildings, it involved transit, to really come together and think about how you could do city building that combined innovation with traditional assets. We had the ambition to create a new kind of place with global impact where people would come to learn about all of the opportunities that were there. And uh, we were looking for a partner that was not only willing to sort of dream with us, but also invest and actually put some financial commitments forward. Um, at that point in time, actually Waterfront Toronto was just coming out of that phase of having any of its seed capital left. Mm -hmm. So we needed to start to rethink how we would sustain our growth to be able to fund the rest of the revitalization effort. The four objectives we set forward in the RFP really focused on those sort of challenges and the opportunities. Creating the globally significant climate positive urban development where carbon uh, reductions are actually greater than the carbon emissions. Establishing a complete community with a range of housing for families of all sizes and income levels and ages and stages, if you will. Uh, having vibrant retail, education related activities and places for good quality, high paying jobs. Providing a test bed for Canadians' clean tech, building materials, and broader innovation-driven sectors to be able to deploy, essentially to become the first customer and to be able to de-risk some of the technology, and to develop a new partnership model that would provide a solid financial foundation uh, for future phases of revitalization. Well, that was in March of 2017 when mm. we released the RFP. I would say society in general was just slightly more innocent in that moment. That was before we had the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal. That was prior to Europe launching their GDPRs or their, their data protection regime. That was before some of the antitrust lawsuits that you've heard about in big tech. And it was before this, this moment or this movement known as tech lash, which all came out of that whole piece. So from March 2017 till even October of 2017 as this process was unfolding, the landscape was changing around us, and there was a lot more that was happening in sort of the common space of civil society to have a dialogue around smart cities. I mean, smart cities aren't new. Many of you were probably involved with the Connecting Canadians program back in 1999 when there was the, the uh, smart communities program and the CAP programs and things like that that happened. But this was a new moment. So there was a different saturation in the media, a different saturation in academia, and the dissemination of information about the risks was becoming far, far better known. Well, that can be a little bit heavy to deal with all the time in terms of media. I think, Cameron, we're averaging probably a dozen media articles a day about the Keyside Project. Nice. The reality is it's brought a, a very interesting combination of factors together. We are now able to have a conversation of these issues with a far broader swath of the population than what we would have in the past. So back in the early 2000s, working on the smart cities work down in Windsor, it was basically governments, industry, and academia talking about these challenges in, in almost a cloistered environment. Now we have a thousand people that come out to our public meetings to discuss the pros, the cons, the pitfalls, the risks, what they're excited about, all with a fairly comprehensive vocabulary and a good amount of awareness because of the amount of work that's been happening, not just with the sort of government agencies in the private sector, but the media and academia, the activist groups and so on. Civic literacy remains a very big challenge for smart city projects, and in particular digital literacy, and having people feel empowered about the decisions that are being made um, is, a, is a difficulty. This is where libraries become a great asset for you. Risk, ethical considerations including privacy, data ownership, data sharing, they're being discussed in a more balanced way than ever before and understanding what those trade-offs really are. It does require sort of the political leadership and municipal leadership to have a different lens and a different set of skills though to be able to navigate those waters. 
Over the course of the last two years, we've learned a lot about what the public has been expecting of a government agency in a relationship with a large technology company. And in this case, we were able to confirm a number of key factors uh, in the past October when we needed to come to ground with Sidewalk Labs on a number of key matters. Cameron will talk about some of the other ones, but privacy and data governance were one of those issues. And in particular, Sidewalk needed to really confirm to us that they were going to conform with all existing and future regulations and privacy laws without exemption and not ask for reform of those. Personal data will be collected here and stored, that is collected here will be stored in Canada, which has been an expectation from our very first public meeting. And just like we did with our sustainability goals and objectives, we're creating a set of guidelines that will even lift the privacy protections beyond what the current regulations are to ensure a greater degree of privacy protection for the citizens and visitors that are coming to this area. We looked at how you could use digital technology to not just enhance service delivery, but to actually increase citizen engagement as well in the project. And at the end of the day, one of the other things that we needed to make sure is that Waterfront Toronto would continue to serve as the lead with governments on all of these matters that were so important and have been evolving so quickly with regards to digital um, policy. There's also another big sort of bucket of new work that comes in because of the smart city space, and that's intellectual property. And this is a very high level slide of just where we are and some of our commitments that we're working towards at Waterfront Toronto. Um, we needed to make sure that we achieved our objective of having Canadian companies have the opportunity to participate and prosper. And there's a number of key things that we've started to work through on this potential uh, project. One of which is the notion of a global patent pledge that will allow Canadian companies to actually leverage the, the patents and the IP that Sidewalk Labs develops and to develop on top of that without there being a fear of legal repercussions or a fear of assertion back on them. So it really allows Canadian companies to take and grow on top of the work that a multinational company is doing. We've also looked at the fact that Waterfront Toronto and its government partners, all three levels, have been contributing heavily to sort of the thinking through of these urban challenges and how things would need to change. And there's a value in that. And putting a value on that element of the project so that the um, public sector continues to receive a return long after the project's deployed from success where Sidewalk Labs may be having worldwide from that initial investment of our time. So we were actually putting into place a revenue share. And then also in the last two years, there's been a lot of, of work product that's been developed around site plans, road plans, uh, public space. We have access to all of that, whether or not we choose to ultimately work with Sidewalk Labs. So we needed to reconfirm that because the public has invested a lot of time and effort into this. Moreover, just to be very clear though, even though we haven't resolved all these issues with Sidewalk Labs, it remains absolutely imperative for us that we have this opportunity for Canadian companies. And we're focused right now on those non-assert provisions to make sure there are those protections in place for Canadian firms. Also making sure that there is fair and transparent procurement processes in place so that Canadian companies who participate aren't then handcuffed for future opportunities or don't have to cede their intellectual property to a large multinational. And we're working with governments, stakeholders, and standard setters setting bodies on data and IP related issues, both to learn from them, but also to be able to share with them our experiences that we've had along the two year journey. So getting to the art of the possible, I'm gonna hand it back to Cameron. Thank you, Christina. <clears throat> um, thanks, Christina. Uh, for some context, Christina has indicated that uh, in October of 2017, Sidewalk Labs won a competitive RFP process and became our innovation and funding partner. In June of this year, they delivered to us uh, what they called the Master Innovation Development Plan. This is a 1,524 page, 18 pound document. Um, and we've spent uh, uh, a considerable time going through each page and trying to digest it into solutions. And we did an evaluation that was just completed in January, January 16th. And the, the evaluation sought to identify, so go through the MIDP, identify how many, issue, how many solutions there are. Well, there were 160. And then identify which ones did double duty. So you'll see as I'm gonna unpack, some of the solutions helped with sustainability, they also helped with economic development. We then looked at which ones deliver real economic development impacts, and which ones drive transformational or systemic change, not just incremental impact, going back to how we try and be transformative in the market. 
We really want step change. We don't want incremental change. And then which are offering a potential to be a unique testbed um, uh, opportunity. So as I said, there were 160 identified. About 144 of them looked like they had legs, uh, that they had, they had some merit to them. We then, then prioritized them into further buckets. We said, first of all, our business is not crowding out private sector investment. It's about crowding in. So most of them, you'll see 92. Uh, contemplate private funding or delivery. This is like advanced uh, infrastructure systems that municipalities wouldn't traditionally do. There are capital pools out there. So we identified where, where would the private sector invest? We said about 92 uh, of the solutions they would invest in. We then looked at what Waterfront Toronto would invest in from some of the proceeds of the land sales. Where would we put our chips? Affordable housing would be an obvious place because we're really trying to drive that. Getting to passive house level of, of, uh, of, of efficiency, another area we'd really like to invest in. And then we said there are a number of public, public priorities that governments have identified themselves where there are funding mechanism, funding envelopes that they would be a natural partner to, to provide um, funding for. Then there was a category where we said tall timber will be the example. Sidewalk has contemplated 30 plus store, stories of tall timber buildings. Right now the building code doesn't allow anything near that. In order for us to realize that tall timber agenda, we would need to have regulatory modernization or reform. So we as an agency would say, look, looks like a good idea for Canada to have a tall timber industry. Uh, let's think about having a safe way of, of implementing that and, and driving uh, regulatory reform. And then there were about 16 that we said uh, we're not, we don't think should be included in what we're going to call an innovation plan. And that's the thing that will go to our board in, in, in May. Um, because we, for a variety of reasons, they're not necessarily bad innovations. They just don't work for us. Um, and I can unpack a few of those for you. So we went through, and we, the, we see the world, as, as Christina said, solving the big, gnarly urban issues. So how do we deal with greenhouse gas emissions? So think, of the, think about how we categorize it. New mobility, sustainability, economic development, and what we call complete communities. And that's really where the affordability agenda is. So in terms of sustainability, we were really, there were 56 of the 100 and 160 solutions. Um, again, as Christina said, we're trying to address uh, the issue, which is real, in, in Toronto, 45% of Toronto's greenhouse gas emissions come from buildings. So what can we do? And Toronto's growing exponentially. So we've got to do a couple things. We've got to decouple this growth that we're having from the GHG emissions. We can't have them growing at the same pace. And um, we need to achieve this 80% climate obje reduction uh, objective by 2050. So what can be done? Well, we looked at mobility. What can we do to get people out of cars? Building design, how, we can, how can we get to passive house levels? What are new construction methods that will reduce GHG, the, again, not relying on necessarily concrete, was, it would be an example, and new energy systems. So the ones we're most interested in, and I'll just point out a few because there's, there's a lot. Pneumatic waste, for example. We've always wanted to do pneumatic waste on the waterfront. It's always evaded us for a variety of reasons. This project does, could put it within our reach. It's, pneumatic waste is being used in Barcelona, Stockholm, it allows for organics and solid waste and recyclables to be moved through tubes underground, and it gets trucks off of the street. So we really like that. Um, and then again, passive house construction, uh, modular construction, battery storage, automated, uh, automated schedules. These are some of, the tech, some of the solutions, not all of them, that we think um, will really bend the curve in terms of addressing GHG emissions. In terms, of, um, in terms of new mobility, again, there were 32 solutions. Some of them do cross over. What, were, what are we trying to track for? Christina mentioned traffic congestion and road trauma. We're trying to get to, to Vision Zero, as well as address GHD issues. So we've got to address congestion. And um, how can we do that? Provide more public transit. That would be an obvious one. More active transportation, biking and walking, making streets safer for pedestrians and cyclists. Reduce the service vehicles. I just mentioned pneumatic waste. That would be an example of where getting service vehicles off the roads and allowing people to be, be able to move around. And then, of course, low carbon mobility options. A couple of things that I would just highlight for your interest. Wayfinding beacons are, are terrific for people who have sight impairments. Uh, there are already apps that allow us to provide beacons that will give environmental information to people who, are, who have uh, sight issues so that they can more safely navigate around. Remember, we want to create a community where people can, of, of all ages and, and abilities. Um, we also are very interested in a, in a discounted mobility package. Again, another 
digitally enabled uh, package which would consolidate all of people's modes of transport to transportation from TTC to e-bikes to, uh, to Lyft and other services and create a, enough volume where you, those could be discounted for people so they have a range of options to get around and w that, that work for them. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, economic development, 25 solutions here. Uh, Look, we're doing well in, in Ontario right now, but we are facing a global competition to attract jobs and to build companies with, that, are future, that provide future-proofed employment and create that scale that Christina mentioned so that our companies can, can uh, reach uh, international markets. So what's the objective? Create, some, uh, create new economy jobs. Catalyze an urban innovation cluster. This is an urban... The inter urban innovation sector is forecasted to be a $2 trillion dollar uh, a year sector in, in the coming years, and we think that we have a competitive strength in this province and this country to glom onto that and become a real player, uh, and then create a, a resilient workforce system, workforce uh, adjustment and training programs. Some of the solutions, uh, Christine has a, a, a re reference, we've got a $10 million urban innovation institute that will help us with R&D and to uh, catalyze that, that sector and allow us to be a big, big player in it. There's a $10 million venture fund contemplated. Sidewalk Works is a program for workforce training so people can get into these new economy jobs. Again, I mentioned mass timber buildings. This, the Sidewalk proposal suggests that there's a huge industry that Canada could be a competitor in, uh, not only in the manufacture of manufacturing plant, but in the whole supply chain, uh, providing, providing the inputs through, through our, our, our wood. And there's contemplation of a Google headquarters um, at, at Keyside as well. And I would just say, in terms of the complete communities, there are 69 solutions. Really, affordability is the big one. Um, and aging in place. So, so Toronto, the biggest cohort um, of growth has been the over 75 in Toronto. It's grown 215% in the last 40 years. It's a big population. Long-term care facilities are priced out of the market now. Uh, and we have to address it. So increase affordable housing, improve uh, public realm and access to waterfront, and I would also say co-living uh, and long-term care are, are, are what we think will make this truly an inclusive and complete community. And some of the solutions, again, I've alluded to affordable housing for all stages of life. These aren't just not micro units. There's contemplated units for, for, for families. Subsidized community space, a lot of it enabled through digital, so if I need to book, a meeting room or if I want a basketball court or whatever, a lot of digital uh, uh, technology that allows me to do that so I can access community space more readily. Uh, modular hex pavement, I know that's a building solution, but it also uh, allows for the snow to melt. So again, if we're looking at, uh, at people aging in place, it makes for a safer street. And then digital mapping of utilities is more of a long-term thing, but we're going to be contemplating not only traditional infrastructure, but advanced infrastructure systems. I talked about pneumatic waste, for example. We need to know that th those services can be provided uh, and they're reliable, and so we need to know in real time uh, that they're functioning properly. So those are some of the solutions. All of this material, by the way, is on, a, uh, and I'll share the, the link, uh, that, that unpacks all of these solutions for you in, in greater detail. In terms of how we're going to come to a decision, or the board is, Ultimately, our board will be um, receiving what's going to call, be called an innovation plan. It will be a distillation of, of what we've heard from the public. It will be a distillation of the evaluation results. And we're going to be asking some questions. Do the solutions raised, do the solutions proposed in the innovation plan and by Sidewalk Labs raise the bar on meeting urban challenges? So we're going to, that's, a, that's the first lens. And you might want to think about this if you're contemplating some, some um, adopting some, some, some similar projects. Does the plan align with the East Bayfront and Keating Channel precinct plans? Are we taking a comprehensive approach to managing data collection and use? Are people going to be comfortable going down there? Are there sufficient controls to address implementation and partner risks? Again, we're talking about some novel technologies here. What are the backstops that we need to have in place in the event that they don't work? What if we have, we do, do we need redundancies because the pneumatic waste thing doesn't work? Those are important considerations that people need to have answered. Is Sidewalk Labs contributing enough to make the project work? And finally, is the proposed public investment, the things that we've identified as an agency and we think government should invest in, are they, are they appropriate, are they defensible? And again, there'll be a lot of voices in, involved in this discussion. I, I mentioned we have a public consultation meeting on, on Saturday. 
We have advisory committees. We have the digital strategy uh, uh, panel, which uh, Christina supports. They provide uh, advice to us. We have an evaluation committee. We have a design review panel that looks at design issues and are they good. We have a stakeholder advisory committee. We have governments that we are constantly involved, uh, in, involved in, in, um, in, in, in getting their oversight. And of course, we have Sidewalk Labs and Alphabet, their, their parent company, to see if, they're, if, if what is netting out is reasonable to them, because they're a player in this. Christina? Thanks, Cameron. So we're going to walk you through just a few of the lessons learned over the past two years, or three years now, coming up to. Um, in terms of how we can actually make sure that there's a path ahead for you, that you're learning from our bruises and don't have to revisit those. So the very first one, and this is something that's always been important to Waterfront Toronto uh, and has become very much an evident uh, need in Smart Cities work, is to engage early and engage often. You need to be able to develop public understanding, both in terms of what you're trying to accomplish, the benefits, the risks, your process of, of going through and making these decisions, and you need to be able to maintain public confidence through this whole project. These projects take on a very different lens now and the amount of media attention and scrutiny. Uh, you need the public support to be able to stand beside you while you're going through this process. And even though we've had public meetings for, for two years, there still needs to be, a, there's a, a thirst for more consultation throughout all of this. Oh, we've got some numbering issues. Um, <laughs> Number two, focus on public benefit over project features and build excitement for outcomes. So it's very easy in smart city projects, if any of you have worked with smart city vendors in the past, the, the shiny baubles oftentimes become the feature. But what really needs to actually be the discussion is about how is this actually making things better? And I would suggest to you the very first question that you need to ask yourself is, do you even need technology to accomplish that outcome? And then start that conversation from there, not which technology, if technology. So really focus on the features, uh, focus on, or sorry, on the benefits, and build the excitement around how life would be improved by actually accomplishing it, regardless of whether or not it's with technology. The third is having acute situational awareness and understanding the legislative and policy framework that you're operating in, as well as having very realistic expectations about any sort of regulatory reform or potential funding that might be required. Uh, and having appropriate contingencies in place for when that doesn't actually come through. The fourth is really defining roles and protocols up front. And this is much more acute, I think, when you're dealing with a, a larger private sector partner, but it is something that is fundamentally important, even if you're working with a consortium of public sec sector bodies, is to make sure everyone knows their swim lanes, that everyone understands what is within the scope of their control, and actually articulate that very clearly to the public. That way people don't have you down for your partner's name when you come to a conference to speak. Um, but that's a, a really big challenge that we've had is people understanding who is Waterfront Toronto, what do they do? Who is Sidewalk Labs, what do they do? Uh, and quite frankly, the project has taken on a bit of a life of its own, and oftentimes it's a lot more exciting to have the big technology company speak. So even though we'll do media interviews, we'll, you know, an hour or two with the media folks, you'll get the article and it's all sidewalk, no waterfront. So you have to be very strong in your own materials and your own positioning so that the public gets that clarity and confidence in who's, who is doing what. And then the fifth is to remain very agile and be able to adapt to an evolving context. Particularly in the digital space, we're seeing policy work happening at the City of Toronto, the Province of Ontario, and in the federal government space. All of this will very much have an impact on how this project moves forward. So being able to actually respond to that and leave enough flexibility in how you're actually working on a project like this is essential. And also being able to be able to respond to public concerns is absolutely vital. A great example of this was the concerns we heard early on in the project about the potential human rights risks that could be associated with smart city work. So we actually added in a human rights impact assessment to look at how smart cities actually can be done in a very ethical way and making sure that they're, that they're not creating any sort of a, a risk in that regard. So that's in a nutshell our five big lessons learned along the way. There are many others, um, and we're happy to talk to you afterwards, and we're happy to open up the conversation for any questions you might have. Or not. Questions? 
Well, if you do have any, you can all, all email. V visit Keysight TO. I'll gain all these materials and deeper dive on all of that we've discussed are available there. And if ever you have any questions, uh, please do reach out to us uh, through, through that venue. Great. And we thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks very much. Thanks again. Thanks again. Thanks very much. Well, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, so we're just going to take a very short break here, and we'll be right back with, uh, with Daniel Bear for the last session of the afternoon. Okay, we're back. Do you think you're open-minded? Well, we'll see at the end of this next presentation. Dr. Daniel Bear is a familiar face to some of you who may have attended OGRA's snow school a couple of years ago. Daniel is one of the leading experts on drug legalization in Canada. He is also a leading thinker about how we are predisposed to making decisions that are informed by factors we don't ever realize. This phenomenon is called unconscious bias and it affects how and why we make the decisions we make, whether at home or at work. Please join me in welcoming Daniel Bear and prepare to have your mind changed. Thank you. Afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for uh, being here for the last talk of the day. I promise I won't delay you getting to happy hour too long. Um, but also starting a few minutes early is really good because I tend to be really verbose and so now I get to go a little bit longer hopefully. So we'll balance out those two things somehow. Um, growing up in Los Angeles, I, uh, I never knew that there were people who actually cared about roads and infrastructure, so it's really cool to be uh, with people who, who care about that. And you can also imagine that uh, I really enjoy these conferences because they're very different to the cannabis conferences I normally am asked to speak at. Uh, slightly different vibe, different uh, drug of choice when the afternoon's over, um, but I really enjoy being here and appreciate the opportunity. So uh, I want to jump in today with uh, just an overview of what we're going to be talking about. Really going to think about what unconscious bias is. It's probably a term you may have heard in passing, uh, depending on your municipality or your organization, you might have already had some unconscious bias or implicit bias training. We're going to use those two terms, uh, unconscious bias and implicit bias, interchangeably today. We're also going to think about uh, how our brain works, how our biases hinder us, and then what we can actually do to counter it. So looking here, I want us to understand that implicit bias or unconscious bias is not an actively controlled element of our thinking process. It is unconscious. So by its very nature, we don't know we're doing it. It is not necessarily aligned with our personal beliefs or attitudes, but it happens nonetheless in the background. And to think about it, it's an automatically uh, activated evaluation that really we have limited to no awareness of. And it's important to understand this at the outset here and to think about this as a neurological or psychological process and then to think about the sociological components that get tied into it. And that's really the two things that we're gonna be thinking about today. So real quick, which one of these people is a murderer? Hands up. They look very similar. So hands up if it's the gentleman in the tuxedo. I've got three, four, five, six, seven, eh, like under half the room thinks it's tuxedo guy. And how many people think it's not tuxedo guy? Okay, answer is not tuxedo guy. That gentleman right there, slouched down. What made you think that it was tuxedo guy? Anybody that raised their hand for that? What made you say tuxedo guy's the killer? Uh, you think I'm setting you up. Yeah, now I realize that part of it, right? But why did you think, okay, so if you thought it's a trick question, he wants us to say the schlubby looking guy, but actually it's the guy in the tuxedo. What, what was the process there? Okay, the trick question part, but what was the part that made you go, oh, I think it's a trick question. I'm supposed to think it's, it's the one guy. Okay, so you think that I purposely put a more upstanding member of society, and what makes you think he's an upstanding member of society? Yeah, or it's like, that could be like a Masonic emblem or some kind, right? How many people here wear a tuxedo on a regular basis? Not a lot, right? The last time you wore a tuxedo was probably either prom or a wedding, 
or something like that, right? It, it sends some idea that you are attending like high function events, right? Um, and one of the actually the interesting things is I've used this photo before and people said the, the photo of tuxedo guy is a lot nicer and that makes me think he's not a killer because it's a nicer photo of him. Um, and actually really interesting, OkCupid, one of the most, the largest dating sites in the world, has done research and identified that photos taken with nicer quality cameras actually get more responses. People are biased towards a nicer photo. Um, same person, doesn't matter, but the nicer quality photo. Now, in part that could be because nicer cameras tend to be used at like weddings and formal events when we've you know, dressed up a bit um, and the selfie in the mirror is not necessarily your best look, but that's a whole other story. <clears throat> so I wanna be clear today, I can't fix your implicit bias. That's not my job today, I can't do it, it's not gonna happen. I'm here to talk about a lot of things about implicit bias, but I can't fix it all. Part of the problem is that implicit bias training works fairly well for the individual, but when it comes to the organizations, if the individual has changed, but the organization's structure and mentality and its own biases have not, that effect of change for the individual training only lasts for a bit of time, and then overall the organization reverts back to its mean. So, even if I was a trained, skilled trainer in implicit bias, uh, I couldn't do enough for your organization today, so call me in and we'll have six sessions and we'll talk pricing later. Um, but let's talk about our brains for a minute. Let's think about why we have these biases, the implications of them, and, and how we're actually, from a cognitive perspective, engaging with them. So we rely on a couple of different mechanisms as humans to be effective. And these are things that are ingrained in us from our history over tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years. We need these processes. So the first is categorization. We want to be able to quickly identify things that are similar and things that are dissimilar. So for example, which one of these is an apple? That's right, they're both apples, despite the fact they are different colors. Very quickly, we can ascertain that these are in fact the same fruit. Now, Anybody here go mushroom foraging? One person, ma'am, you are much more brave than I. Uh, because if you think about it, the difference between the angel of death mushroom and the best risotto you've ever had is minuscule. You need that categorization capability to tell the difference between them very quickly. That's a key skill as humans that we need. And even when we uh, break apart something, we can still tell that the, the part of the apple facing up is still an apple to us. We understand that intrinsically. This is part of our neurological functioning. It's really good that we're able to do this. It saves us a lot of time and mental energy. We also need simplification. Our minds do not like complexity. They don't like conflicting information. They don't like to have all this ambiguity around us. We would much rather, instead of seeing something like this, where there's you know, 25, 30 shades of gray, We'd much rather see something like this. This works much better for us. And in fact, our brain tries largely to go from this to this. In any situation that it can, reduce the extraneous information, take in what we need. If you had in your everyday life to actually process every photon of light and every wavelength of sound and every smell of the person next to you on the TTC, you would be completely overwhelmed. Our brain simplifies as much as possible. You know, you ever notice that after a while in a place that smells different, it stops smelling? Yeah, that's because our brain goes, okay, that's fine, not a problem, let's like get that one, get rid of it, we don't need it. The other thing we like, and this is really the most important element here, are schemas. Schemas are essentially a script. It's a script that we write for ourselves when we're young, and we add things to it from time to time, but it essentially allows us to interact with people in ambiguous situations without having to process what that situation is. Now, I'll use an example that might be familiar to many of you since this is the OGRA conference. Imagine if every time you came to an intersection, you had to figure out what everyone at that intersection was going to do. It would be chaos, right? So we learn we understand rules, but then we also have to understand how people are going to react and do those rules. I think it's Philadelphia, is it Philadelphia or Pittsburgh, where there's, a, there's like an, uh, a thing where in that town, it's a standard practice that people make a left turn when the light turns green, and you're expected to let the first car make a left turn and do that. 
that would be total chaos here. I think we've got enough problems as is. Imagine also if one of these furry little creatures showed up at your door, right? In Toronto, we like to call them trash pandas, but they are raccoons. Imagine if one of these little guys showed up at your door, you would know right away to be like, hey, get out of my house, this isn't okay. But if you didn't understand what a raccoon was and understand the implications of a raccoon in your kitchen, you would say, hello, good sir, what are you doing here? How was your day? I don't understand why you're here, but let's figure this out. You don't need that. You don't want to wait for it to be destroying your trash cans and you know, toppling your food. We are really, really good at developing these schemas. They start when we're very young, and they're influenced by a number of things. Our parents, um, the music and television and media we consume. You can think about schemas as a cultural thumbprint pressed into you that teaches you how to understand and engage with different situations in different groups. I'm not one of these presenters that puts up walls of text all the time and just reads for them, I promise, but I think this quote is worth it, so I'm gonna read it to you. It is likely that these schemas or biases will be triggered when judging the behavior of a person that accords with one's pre-existing mental image for the group to which the person belongs, especially when the observed behavior is ambiguous. An individual may therefore respond in a learned way to another individual who is a member of a particular group with which he or she has experiences or a history. I'm gonna take us back a few decades here, but was it like late 80s, early 90s when like every comic had a mother-in-law bit in their routine? Think about that. It set the stage for what mother-in-laws were supposed to be. Media portrayal of mother-in-laws, whether in television or comedy, or whatever it was, it was like, oh, she's so naggy, she's up in our business, right? It set an idea, it was a cultural thumbprint most mother-in-laws are not like that. If this is being live streamed, my mother-in-law is watching, I love you, you're wonderful. Uh, you don't fit any of those stereotypes. Um, <coughs> excuse me. These schemas are really important. They help us make sense of the confusing life that we are involved in. Our society is complex. Our relationships are multifaceted. We have power structures that differ in family and in our community, political, all, all sorts of things, and we need to be able to navigate them. This is particularly true in policing. Police take in a massive amount of information whenever they arrive on scene at a situation. They need to be able to ascertain what is going on, what the relationships are, and how they need to engage in the situation immediately. My doctoral work uh, basically had me spending a year in the back of a police car. And I can tell you, every situation that police officers arrive to is different than the other one. You could never write a manual that said, here's what to do when you arrive at this type of call, because every call is different. The power dynamics are different. The, so the sociological factors are different. Every situation is different. So they need to start running these scripts right away to be able to make sense of what is going on. And this is a really valuable and important tool. But again, remember, this is not simply a neurological process taking place it is imbued with a sociological history. And the problem in the criminal justice system as, that we've seen is that they're not taking in unbiased information. All that information that police officers are learning to write that script has with it a sociological history that involves race, ethnicity, power, a whole host of issues. And this has shown itself, to be frank, in the use of force rates that are frankly, pretty disproportional in many places. This is a particular problem in the US, but we're by no means immune to it here in Canada. Does anybody know who the individual on screen is? His name is Philando Castile. Anybody now recognize it with the name? Yeah. Philando Castile was driving in his car in Minnesota, in St. Paul, Minnesota. He was with his girlfriend and their child. It was about nine o'clock at night. Philando Castile gets pulled over for the 49th time in the last 13 years because a police officer said he looked like a robbery suspect they were looking for. Police officer pulls Philando Castile over, says license and registration. Philando Castile says, officer, I have a concealed carry permit for a firearm. I have the firearm on me. Exactly what he's supposed to do. The officer says, don't pull out your firearm. Philando Castile is reaching to get his license and registration as he's just been asked, and he says, I'm not pulling out my firearm. The officer says, don't pull out your firearm. 
Philando Castile says, I'm not pulling out my firearm. Before he can go on, the officer shoots him several times. The officer was responding to a script that he had learned. It caused immensely tragic results. This case became famous in part because Philando Castile's girlfriend pulled out her camera and started a live stream video as Philando Castile is in the car dying after being shot. It's, it's horrible video, I don't recommend watching it, but it's a very powerful example. Philando Castile had run uh, the lunch and, and food programs at a middle school in Minnesota for like 15 years at that point. He was beloved by students. He in no way was involved in any sort of criminal activity. But for the officer, late at night, potential robbery suspect, his, his scripts started playing. It was almost like a program. And when he saw furtive movement, he reacted in the way that he felt was appropriate. And that's because that's what had been triggered. That's the schema that had been triggered for him. Does anybody know, oops, there we go. Does anybody know who this is? This is Officer Yanez. This is the man who shot Philando Castile. This isn't an issue of black and white. This isn't an issue of simple racism in that old school, you know, depends on the word you're using. I go back to this idea that it's a cultural thumbprint. It's about what culture tells us are the groups that are desired and the groups that are undesired. And we start getting into this problem where we start understanding who is undesirable and we start having this illusionary um, correlative problem where we start seeing the undesirable actions and undesirable traits in groups or individuals we think are undesirable. Not that we actively think are undesirable, not that we profess some hatred for or wouldn't want our daughters dating, but things that have been baked into us. And again, going back, it's unconscious bias. Officer Yanez was found not guilty uh, on three counts, uh, three felony counts, uh, but that didn't take away the tragedy of what had happened there. Does anybody know who these two individuals are? So the person on the, on the right, the young black man there, is Trayvon Martin. The young white guy with the tie is Brock Turner. Trayvon Martin is, of course, famous because he was killed by George Zimmerman uh, in a, outside George Zimmerman's Florida home. George Zimmerman saw Trayvon Martin walking with a bag of Skittles and an Arizona iced tea and a hoodie up and confronted him. A fight ensued. George Zimmerman shot him. Brock Turner found someone on the Stanford campus, a young woman who was passed out from alcohol, and raped her while she was unconscious. These are the photos that were put out by the media depicting these two different young men. One is the victim of a crime, one is the perpetrator, and yet their depiction in the media, these are some of the first images released of them, their depiction is wildly different here. This is not because the editors of those newspapers you know, secretly have a massive swastika tattoo on the back of their, you know, behind their shoulder or something. These are not like racists sending a purposeful message. This is simply the way that we have that cultural thumbprint repeatedly put into us and reinforced time and again. This image popped up for a half second at the beginning of the slide. Did anybody notice that when the presentation first started? It popped up for a half second. And the reason I did that is because this is from a 1947 study that looked at uh, how witnesses uh, take in and use information. And it portrays a, what is supposed to be a white person with a straight razor. You can kind of see the straight razor in his hand there and, and there, uh, confronting a black man on what is supposed to be a bus or a subway of some kind. And in 1947, this was used in a study. To, uh, it flashed for people. They gave people a few seconds to see the image. And then they asked them afterwards, what was going on in this scene? Well, lo and behold, most of the white people questioned in this said, a black man was assaulting a white man with a knife. We see these things when we are triggered to see them. We are put into a situation, we see things, and the schema runs, and the script is there, and it runs. And again, it's not because people are sitting there saying, well, I'm an out and avowed racist. I don't like certain groups. These are implicit biases. They trigger us, and they run almost on, on an automated script. But unconscious bias is not limited simply to race. This isn't just a racial issue. This is around a number of issues. Obesity is a huge area where unconscious bias plays a role. It's so powerful, in fact, that parents provide less support 
to their obese college-age children than they do to their non-obese college-age children. Think about it. A parent's love is supposed to be unconditional, right? Anybody in here, like, would, would tell one of their kids they like them better than the other one? Probably not. But we're supposed to love our kids equally and, and unabashedly. Although my daughter's in daycare right now, and frankly, if I got coronavirus, I wouldn't notice at this point because she brings home all sorts of things. So that's a whole other story. But this obesity thing is, is incredibly powerful, and it's not limited to simply a parent-child relationship. We also see it in the workplace. Obese employees are more likely to have more days of absenteeism. And that is not simply a result of health issues that they might incur. It's in part because of stigma and isolation they feel in the workplace. Again, this is not simply a health issue. It is a how people feel. And I guarantee that there are very few of you saying, well, I would turn to my colleague who's got a few extra pounds and shame them for it. These are implicit biases and the way that they're interacted with are often subtle um, and, and, and far less expressive. You know, we think about um, bias and discrimination sort of like the first half of American History X. You remember that film? Edward Norton, you know, he's the out and the out, avowed Nazi. Uh, that was actually shot in the neighborhood where I grew up, which is really weird to see on film full of Nazis. Uh, that's a whole other story. Actually, a whole other story on that. The high school where Ed Norton goes in there, also the same high school where they shot Greece. So, two very different films shot in the same location. And if you learn nothing about implicit bias today, you can say, guess what? I'm now gonna be one better at, you know, next time we do pub trivia night. So, this is a really powerful thing. But you might be saying, well, Daniel, um, I'm not obese. I'm not a person of color. Don't worry, you're not safe. It goes to things like sexual orientation, age, attractiveness, gender, physical ability, religion, all of these things trigger implicit biases. Because if you think about it, it's about that cultural thumbprint. And our culture has ideas about desirable religions and undesirable religions, desirable age categories and undesirable age categories. Anything where you can see that we've set some sort of desirability about, there is implicit bias pushed onto us. Even professors, like me, are biased. There's been plenty of research that shows that we actually are biased against students who have names of different ethnicities than the professor. We, we see a name on a roster, we see a name on a term paper, our implicit biases get triggered, and it depends on the, on the name. It's different if it's an Asian student or an Asian sounding name versus if it's a name that might be from a black student or a Latino student. Um, I, of course, because I'm aware of implicit bias, suffer from none of these. Uh, now, that's total hubris. I probably do too, right? Like, I can talk about this stuff and I can be up here. Those schemas still got imprinted on me. I was still exposed to the same media, the same uh, societal information. All of these things that shaped me and shaped all the other professors of my generation we're all doing the same thing, whether we talk about implicit bias or whether we have no clue that it exists. And here's the problem. Your biases will become your discrimination. I worked with a wonderful police officer when I, when I was doing my uh, PhD. Lovely guy. He was in his late 50s, um, had been, on the, you know, been in the police since he was like 19, and he was one of these old school London coppers, right? Didn't wear a bulletproof vest, and where all the new younger police officers wore these, you know, black combat boots, he wore Dickies uh, loafers, right? Like, he was just relaxed, uh, you know, really good at talking to people. He, and actually, and like the least racist person you could hear when you talk to him about issues, right? Um, in fact, his wife was black. They had several multiracial kids, right? There were like the perfect like vision of like, oh, this is amazing. Like, it's a post-racial world, blah, blah, blah. He could not drive past a person who appeared Chinese to him without finding something suspicious going on. Something. Well, the way they were standing against that uh, bus stop. Well, the way they were walking and didn't look at the police car. The way they were walking and did look at the police car. Didn't matter. He found something suspicious. Whenever. And you talk to him about racial issues, policing issues, you never would have seen it, right? And, and this guy was discriminating. If he thought they were Laotian or Thai, no, no, didn't, didn't bother him at all. Filipino, Japanese, anything? Nope. Chinese? He could tell. He was so discerning that he said that he could discern between someone who was from Hong Kong, mainland China, and Taiwan. 
Like, that's what he thought he could do. Your biases will become your discrimination. You will act these out. And how will you do this? Well, you'll do it in a variety of ways. Again, this is not Edward Norton in the first half of American History X. This is not you joining a Nazi club or something. This is not about the out and out you know, use of profane language and open discrimination. Racism and the biases and discrimination that we might engage in are not that in your face. They're subtle. In fact, we call them often microaggressions. And a microaggression is simply that. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's the look you give to someone. It's the way you say something. It's the way you interact with someone, whether you hold the door or not for someone. You know, and it's, it's incredibly difficult to measure, right? Well, did you hold the door longer for that person who was five steps away because of the color of their skin? And did you let the door go for that other person who was four steps away because of the color of their skin? It's incredibly hard things to measure, but they are readily felt by the people experiencing these microaggressions. They will come out and they will continue to come out provided that you and your organization don't take active steps to engage with them. Now again, you know, I go back to what I said at the beginning here, these biases are against often your stated perception, your stated beliefs. They come out despite the fact you saying, I want an open and inclusive and non-discriminatory workplace. I want to create the kind of world that my kids will be proud to grow up in. These things come out even when you are not intentionally trying to have them come out. And they result in bad decisions. And this is where we start to think about the impact on us. You know, if you're a municipality uh, or you're an organization trying to ensure the best possible delivery of services here, the way you view your potential clients, the way you view the people using your services is important to how you construct and deliver them. And if your implicit biases are unchecked, if they're not <laughs> <coughs> excuse me, readily addressed, you run the risk of letting them manifest and making decisions that undercut your, it's not simply your stated values and beliefs, but undercut your mission and your intention here. So what can you actually do? This is the part academics normally don't get to. We talk about the problem, we tell you everything's wrong, and then we say, great, thank you, good night. But I'm actually gonna tell you what you can do. Um, so mark this down. Don't say academics never did anything like this. There's a number of things you can do. The first and foremost is self-awareness. Talking about it, being in this room right now, is a key first step in addressing, understanding, and eventually doing something about the unconscious biases which are in your organization and you as an individual. Again, all of us have them. These are part of a neurological process that got poisoned with some bad sociological data. So we need to address them and understand what that corrupted data looked like. We need to be able to see that so we can actually move forward with it. One of the key ways to do this is to run what's known as an implicit association test. And you can take these online. They're really kind of fun. They pop a word up in front of you and they ask you to um, you know, go one side or the other uh, and then uh, just pick whichever this word associated with, and they give you two keys on the keyboard, one that says white, one that says black, one that says old, one that says young. And you can take these tests about everything. Uh, we ran a research study in the UK with prison officers, and we did this implicit association testing with them. And the trick to the implicit association test is it's measuring how quickly you press the button. And you're told, don't think, just react. You see a word flash up, just react as quickly as you can. And it's interesting because you can tell when someone's gaming the system and trying to put the sort of appropriate or what they think are the good answers, because they take longer, because it has to register in their mind, what do I think? No, wait, what's the right answer? Okay, now press the right button. And so you can tell how people are actually biased in part by when they're trying to not appear biased. Um, and you can also tell when they are biased just because they're really quick with the bias pushing. Um, and these are really interesting tests. You can do them online. and. I, I'm going to tell you right now, most of you are going to find out that you have some implicit biases you didn't know you had. But that's okay. That's the whole point of taking this. Step one is acknowledge a problem. Um, this is not a 12-step program that we're going to go down here, but the st first step is similar, I'll be honest, and go that. The other thing is to work to understand the nature and the impact of biases in your work. Once we understand that they exist, 
once we see that there is an issue, it's important to take stock and say, how is this actually affecting my organization? And that's not a comfortable conversation to have for the most part, because odds are it's negatively affecting your organization. And it's doing so potentially in areas of race, ethnicity, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, areas that are not comfortable, right? Areas where you want a lawyer in the room if you're gonna start discussing them, or you want a counselor, or you want someone who seems more qualified to talk about it than you, right? These are not something where we go, yes, let's go in and have this difficult discussion today. I feel fully capable of handling all the intricacies and nuances that are coming at us. Most people don't. And so it is important to understand what's going on, and if necessary, to engage individuals, uh, whether implicit bias trainers, uh, whether legal departments, to think about how the actual impact is being felt in your organization and what you as an organization can do about it. The third element here, and this ties in together, is to promote bias literacy. That simply means that it's important to know about how people talk about bias and to know what biases they're observing here. Be able to have those conversations because the first time your organization sits down to say, what kind of bias do we have, how is it affecting us, is gonna be the most uncomfortable. But if you build that literacy of bias into it, if you build a literacy where people feel capable of engaging with their own biases, understanding what they look like, discussing them openly, and having the frank conversations necessary to reduce those biases and their impact, you will begin to see the effect of change there. Because remember I said at the beginning, I could give you the world's best most effective bias training that has ever been delivered. And you as the individual, statistically speaking, would benefit. Your biases would be reduced. Your implementation or engagement of those biases would be reduced. But over time, while your biases might be reduced, if the organization did not change with you, the organization as a whole will sort of return to the average level of bias that it had before the training. The individual is only one component of this. The organization as a whole needs to think about what it's doing and how it's engaged with this. And that requires getting to a point where people are capable of talking about it. And the final way to do this, uh, to combat biases, is to create the structures that will prevent them from being acted upon. You do all that you can to reduce them, but you also uh, do all that you can to reduce their implementation. And so, you know, if you're working in the public sector right now, you probably already have structured job interviews. Uh, you have clear criteria for promotions. Your evaluations are probably structured. But these are all things that come about because of bias. And what we need to make sure that we do is that there is ways of engaging, uh, sorry, ways of blocking the engagement of these bias and the way that they're acted upon. Uh, and that requires a lot of thought. The reason there's a picture of a cellist up here is because symphonies have done this fairly well. Symphonies now do what's called a blind audition. So what happens is the person auditioning for the symphony comes up on stage, you know, they're gonna play their violin or their cello, whatever, and there's a curtain that goes across the stage like this. And on the other side of the curtain sit the people who are making the hiring decision. And they have no idea if the violinist is a man or a woman, if they went to school with that person or not if that person is incredibly attractive or not. They have no idea. The violinist could have three foot mohawk purple spiked hair and be completely disheveled. Doesn't matter. The quality of their music is what will be heard, not their visual appearance, not the thing that might trigger their bias. In a sort of less fancy version of this, have you seen The Masked Singer? Anybody have seen that? The premise is pretty simple. A celebrity or someone famous, I guess that's the same thing, celebrity or someone famous. They'll give anyone a PhD these days. <laughs> they put them in a costume, they put them in a mask, and they get up on stage and they sing their heart out, right? And the whole idea is, in part, like, oh, this is interesting, I don't know who this is. The other thing is, it removes that potential bias. You don't know if it's someone you like or someone you hate, right? It could be some Kardashian that you completely despise singing, but you don't see that. You hear this angelic voice and you go, that sounds like the voice of a beautiful billionaire, right? 
And then they take the mask off and you're like, oh my God, it's Rob Gronkowski of the Patriots or something, which is apparently one of the rumors that's out there now. Um, I didn't include a picture of the mask singer because I wasn't sure of copyright issues there and I didn't want to run into anything, but you all get the point. Uh, the other thing that you can see is we do this in academia as well. So oftentimes when I'm grading a paper, I'll do what's known as blind grading. The student's name will not appear to me on the submitted paper and I'll simply read the paper and judge it for its quality. I won't know the student's name or gender or ethnicity. I won't know if I've seen that student falling asleep in class or if it was some student who wrote a snotty email to me and now I'm harboring some resentment that though I wouldn't consciously act on, now I might subconsciously act on. So we do blind grading there. And that's another way of, again, preventing our biases from affecting the way that we're judging people and, and, and engaging with them. These are all relatively simple, straightforward things to do, right? None of the things that I've described here for combating bias are beyond the capabilities of any of the organizations here. They might not be particularly comfortable things to do. They might not be particularly desirable. Thing. Like, you probably have enough things going on in your schedule at the moment. You're like, great, one more thing we gotta think about. I'm unconsciously being a jerk to people. Great. That's not exactly the message here, but it's important to see all of these steps are straightforward and doable by any organization in here. All that is necessary is the desire to carry them out. And again, they may not be the most smoothly carried out things you've ever done. They might be a little bit outside your wheelhouse, but they are capable of being done. And there is also professionals who help people do this, who help organizations do this. You're not on your own. I like particularly to think of Daniel Kahneman's three questions. Uh, this is a, a guy, he's a Nobel laureate. Uh, he wrote the book you might have heard of, Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. And while he didn't write these three questions directly in response to implicit bias, he wrote them about a slightly different uh, uh, phenomena, I think they do work really well when people or organizations are thinking about uh, decisions they're making that might be impacted by their unconscious biases. And the first thing he said is that you have to ask yourself, is this decision based on overconfidence or an attachment to past experiences. I think the past experiences part aligns with schemas and those ideas pretty well there. But we have to take a step back. Are we making decisions simply because it resonates with a past experience that we felt worked well or ties into what we think is the way things should be going on? And frankly, this probably works far beyond unconscious bias, but it is particularly important when we're dealing with issues that may be affected by unconscious bias. The second thing he says is, have we preemptively fallen in love with your decision? That might be too strong a word for some situations, but again, are we thinking about and engaging in an idea and saying, this is the one for me, this is the one I love, and in fact, part of the way you got there was because of your unconscious bias, because of the things that have shaped your view of either the people using your service uh, the people who are your stakeholders, are those things shaping how you view this decision um, and allowing us to sort of get too far ahead of ourselves? Uh, and finally, the third thing that he says is that did we give dissenting opinions uh, an opportunity to be voiced in this discussion? And this is incredibly critical because what we found uh, in previous research is that if there's a very hierarchical nature of discussions where someone is in command and control, another individual who might be able to provide important perspective to us uh, often is not able to say, actually, can you check yourselves on that? We've all seen, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> uh, TV commercials or campaigns where someone went, yeah, this seems like a good idea. And once it went to air, everybody went, oh my God, you put that, you put that out there? Often it's because uh, uh, dissenting opinions didn't have a good opportunity to engage with that. This actually comes from another phenomena um, where we've developed what's called structured communication. Uh, this sort of is a little bit different here, but it's important about in organizations to make sure that individuals who are not necessarily in charge have the opportunity to give a, a voice and, and have uh, the ability to say something. And this actually comes out of the airline industry because what they found is that captains were killing people because they weren't listening to first officers. The, you'd, you'd hear on the black box recorder a first officer saying, um, uh, Captain, uh, and the captain's saying, shut up, we're fine. And then the first officer would say something like, um, 
Uh, actually, I think maybe the captain would say, shut up, we're fine. And if we have those hierarchical uh, organizations and those structures, particularly you know, captain and not the captain of the plane, you really need to make sure that you have this dissenting opinion given space. And sometimes that requires actually setting up a formal structure to say, here's the decision we're thinking about. OK, person who is not in charge of executing that decision, how does this look to you? Does this make sense? And, and so I think beyond the issue of implicit bias, that's probably a really good thing for most organizations as well. So that's it. That's the topic of implicit bias. I wish there was a lot more that I could get into, but it's really actually fairly simple. We run very powerful computers in our mind. We are the top example in the animal kingdom on this planet. We have computing power in our brain, which is beyond anything imagined by any other animal, and then some. But it is fraught with ways of processing that information that require culture and data. And that data that we take in from a young age is not perfect. It is biased itself. It is often racist, discriminatory. It is misogynistic. It brings all these things into us. And though outwardly, we do not want to express these opinions, and we would be, you know, we're abhorrent at the idea that we would carry on the, the past, that we would be part of the same problems we identified growing up with. We get that thumbprint of society pushed into us like warm wax, and it sets. And those biases rest within us, and they stick there. And from time to time, the schemas, the scripts that are written at a young age, get triggered. And we interact with people, particularly when it's an ambiguous situation and we're not sure what we're supposed to do. The script gets triggered, we run the script, and we move forward. But I'm here to say that though those exist, they are capable of being amended, curtailed, and if your organization works at it, reduced significantly for the long term. Thank you very much. I'm Daniel Baer. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks very much. Well, thanks very much, everyone. That concludes the program for today. So enjoy your evening, and we'll see you back here bright and early tomorrow morning. Have a good night.